Jordan Landing, you sound good. Let's have some fun. Yeah. Oh, love it. Thank you so much for coming out. Love doing comedy. Love being a comedian. Uh, but I hate telling people that I'm a comedian because outside this room, nobody cares. Uh, even in this room, I think it's 50-50. Honestly, I feel like some of you were like drug against your will and in the car, you're like, he better not suck. Or I'm picking the next two date nights. I get it. And I appreciate you coming either... You laughed too hard at that one for that one <laughs> to have not been true. That was laughed a little too hard. My family's cool with me being a comedian. They're all right with it. They're not like super excited about it, but they're cool with it. You gotta understand, I come from a very proud immigrant home. I'm actually a first generation American. I know not super popular to say in this administration, but I'll say it. My family's actually from Athens, Greece. That's where my mom is from. That's where she was born. And thank you. That's, that's the Greece level there. Just one little woo. That's how the Greeks get admired now. Woo! Good job. That was on par. But my grandma looked around and she's like, you know, we should go. It's not a good look when your national monuments rubble. That's a bad look. That's not where you want to like settle down and raise some kids. And listen, Greece had a good run. It had a great run. It's over. Okay? It's over. It's time to rebuild like the Utah Jazz roster. You got to cut it down. And you got to start again. Even if it's never as good as it once was, you keep trying, I get it. So she brought my, my mom over on a plane with passports. It was all legit. You can check. Don't check hard, but you can check. And they settled down in Virginia, actually, true story. And my grandmother was actually the first female dental professor at Georgetown University. That's what she did. A lot of cool stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, tell jokes in strip malls. So they're not like super impressed with what I'm doing with this freedom that they work so hard to get. Like, we don't bring it up at Thanksgiving, is what I'm saying. Thank goodness the last three have been canceled. Here's hoping for four in a row, honestly. We're looking for pandemic positives at this point. <laughs> I'm also the oldest of four kids. I'm the firstborn. My mom calls me the Greekest of the four kids, which gets a laugh, I don't know why, but yes. I am, I am the Greekest, I guess. I got the darkest skin, I got the darkest hair, but that's not my fault. That's because my mother married a blonde American like a fool and ruined the bloodline. My grandma's words, not mine. I would never say that. I would never say that. But it is true. Anyway, because of that, my siblings got progressively lighter as they came out. It's weird, like my youngest brother is blonde haired, blue eyed, just the Aryan nation on the other end of the spectrum. And it doesn't look good when we're all together. The family portrait just looks like an ink cartridge that didn't have enough for the project. It looks weird. And people ask my mom, why didn't you have any more kids? She just says, I ran out of toner. And she's not lying. We couldn't risk a redhead. We couldn't risk it. You've seen how that ends up. No way. Had to cut her off. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but for a while, I was actually raised by my mom and my grandma. It was just the three of us for a while. And I got raised in an immigrant home. I had a very different upbringing than a lot of people. But it was awesome. We stuck together. It was good. But I always feared and respected my grandmother more than any other person in the world. And I remember the day that that actually happened, vividly. We're going to go over it right here, right now. I was five years old. I was helping her in her garden because all immigrants have gardens, that's kind of their thing. And I saw a snake, I saw like a two foot snake. And in my five year old brain, snakes equals death. And I freaked out, I was like, ah, yeah, yeah, there's a snake. Yeah, yeah, is Greek for grandma, you learned something. Anyway, I was like, grandma, there's a snake. My grandma was calm. She didn't flinch at all. She's like, tell me where it is. I'm like, by the beats. My grandma took a shovel, walked up to it, <laughs> chopped it in half, first try. Immigrants don't double tap, they do it right the first time. And she took that snake out. 
And I was just absolutely shocked. And then my grandmother said the most gangster thing I've ever heard in my entire life. She leaned in close to me and just said, it should have known better. <laughs> oh! <laughs> then she did the most gangster thing I've ever seen, took the carcass of the snake and hung it on the gate of her garden to <laughs> warn other snakes not to mess with her garden or her grandson in that order. <laughs> Holy cow. And in that moment, my grandma went above snakes on my fear meter, just all the way to the top. And I just remember thinking, I'm gonna do what this woman says for the rest of my life. And listen, you should never hit a child. You should never abuse a child, absolutely not. But you should kill something in front of them, absolutely. <laughs> they should know what you're capable of, that's all I'm saying. I'm not gonna say Gen Z kids are soft, but if you kill the snake in front of them, some chores are getting done. I'm just saying. <laughs> Might cause some good. That's a hunter right there. That one. Been there, done that, Paul. Oh, the pandemic's finally over, which is good. Finally, just in time for World War III. It's gonna be a nice transition. <laughs> I think the slogan will be, take off your mask, take up your arms, and it's gonna be fun. The posters are gonna get creative, it'll be good. But even though the pandemic's over, it changed a lot of things. Things that are never gonna go back to the way they were, ever, no matter how much we wish that they would. And people ask Paul, what's the biggest thing you notice? What's the number one change? That one's easy. Men are washing their hands in public now. That changed, it changed. <laughs> Ladies, I gotta be honest with you, we weren't, ever. We lied to you the whole time, absolutely. And even when the pandemic happened, Guys were very hesitant. They're like, ah, this will blow over. And then they took away sports, and men lost their minds. March without college basketball? This is madness! All right, all right, we will wash our hands, since apparently it's a big deal. So I am happy to report that men are washing their hands in public now, as long as someone else is in there. That's the rule. That's, that's the compromise we came up with. Oh, man. But now with the pandemic over, people are going back to work. Some of them, a little bit. Some people never went out for the pandemic. They always stayed out in the field. Some people, now that they're home, have no desire to go back to the office at all. Like my work, is trying to get people to come back and they was, come on, let's go. Let's go back to the office. And I went back in finally after like two years. I'd never thought I'd be so excited to go work in an abandoned building. It was great. <laughs> because nobody wants to go back to the office. No one at all. Does anyone, anyone here working from home still to this day? Raise a hand. What do you do? What do you do that you work from home and you're just like, I'm not leaving? I work for Warner Brothers. You work for Warner Brothers. What do you do for Warner Brothers that you don't have to leave your house? Okay, so words that I don't understand. <laughs> you preview tapes? I play video games. You play video games for oh. Warner Brothers. So you never went to an office. Ever. So you don't apply. You wanted to let everyone know that not only do I still work in the office, I've never worked in an office, you peasants. Thank you so much. <laughs> let me be more specific, since I have to be. Who used to work in an office but still works at home? Anyone? Who's working at home that used to work in an office that doesn't play video games for a living to mock comedians? You? What do you do? You value businesses, and you've never had to leave to go value them in person. You can just like figure it out at home? Right at home. Right at home. But you used to be in an office, yeah. but now you, you're just not. Have they tried to get you back in the office? No. no. They're just like, we don't like you while you were here, so stay there. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, this has gone horribly. <laughs> this could not have gone worse in any possible way. One never worked in the office. The other one, they don't want him back. So that was literally the two scenarios that I hadn't thought of. When I was thinking, this would be a great time to involve the crowd. My mistake. But I, but I am trying to get my coworkers. I like going to the office. I like commuting a little bit, get in the car, yell at someone, get the blood pumping. I like to do that. I like to get out, start my day right. I try and get my coworkers to go to the office and no one, no one wants to go back. And they're like, Paul, we would, we really would, but you know, pants. Like that's the big hang up. <laughs> Jeans are the deal breaker. No one wants to do that. I think you're gonna have to include gym shorts 
into, uh, into the corporation's business model if you want to get people back in the office. It'd be fun. That'd be like a new suit. Like, just do a pants suit with, like, stretchy jeans. That could be fun. <laughs> that might get people back in the office. Not these two. Not a chance in the world. <laughs> but maybe some normal people that I didn't get to talk to. That <laughs> might convince them. <laughs> Thank you so much. I want to talk to this guy and absolutely destroy everything he thought was going to happen. <laughs> and have it recorded for time and all eternity. <laughs> cool, cool. Four years, okay. I'll tell you one thing I didn't do during the pandemic, one thing I never did. I never ordered DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats. I don't like any of those. I don't understand how during a pandemic we're like, you know what? Let's keep people that have never had a food handler's permit out there delivering food <laughs> during a pandemic. I don't understand how that happened. And I'm a paranoid guy. I don't trust that at all. I would rather pay Uber to drive me to Five Guys just to watch it all go down, just to make sure it's on the up and up, right? <laughs> like that guy coughed, do it again. Like I can't, <laughs> can't take chances. And this is how I know I don't like DoorDash. This is how I know like, do I don't like it. Their big marketing scheme is, hey, download the app, first week's free. You don't have to pay for anything, we got you. We'll spot you, just try it out, see how you like it. If you like it, come back. And I refuse to support a company that has the same business model as drug dealers. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, you're not tricking me with that again. Nope. <laughs> My mother taught me better, say no to drugs and DoorDash, the two Ds, you gotta stay away from them, absolutely. There's more, but those are the big two. Those are the big two. Oh man. But the worst of the pandemic was 2020. Everyone knows that. It didn't change for you, but for the rest of the world. <laughs> but 2020 was the worst. And this is how you know 2020 was a terrible year. This is how you know. The absolute pinnacle of joy, the highlight of the entire year, was a documentary about caged tigers. That <laughs> was the only good thing that happened to this country for an entire year. Didn't matter how terrible our lives were, in March 2020, we rallied together as an entire country to sit down and unanimously declare Carol Baskin killed her husband. That, that is the only thing we agreed on as a country for an entire year. But I wanna thank Tiger King. I wanna thank that documentary. Because of Tiger King, I will believe any movie plot for the rest of my life. Nothing. Nothing's off limits. I used to be a big critic of movies like, nah, that could never happen, there's no way. Not now, not after Tiger King. <laughs> Anything's possible. Just think about it. In this, in this world, in this country, there was a man who ran a 200 tiger zoo by feeding the tigers expired Walmart meat, convinced two straight men to marry him simultaneously while high on meth ran for president of the United States of America, put out three country music albums, all while trying to kill a woman in Florida. If that can happen, the Fast and Furious is possible. All 10 of them. I'm in for the ride. That was wild, man. Say what you will, he was crazy, but he was productive. Man, he did a lot. I have to get the motivation just to go to Costco, you know? It's crazy. Pandemic wasn't all bad though. One very good thing did happen during the pandemic for me. I got married during the pandemic, finally. Yes, thank you very much. I love it, got married, finally. My mom had a similar reaction. It was good. <laughs> Don't chime in now. <laughs> Ruiner. But no, I love that I got married. Love my wife, but it does sting a little that it took a pandemic for a woman to take a chance on me. Do you know what I mean? That doesn't feel great, you know? I was striking out for 15 years with a healthy dating pool. Suddenly some guys got sick and I started looking pretty good. <laughs> so we might not mention that part to the kids. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, but I was dating in my 30s. Dating in your 30s is very different than dating in your 20s. Because in your 20s, you were trying to show off. Right? You're trying to prove you're better than everyone she was going out with. But in your 30s, you're just trying to prove you're not as bad as everyone she's already dated <laughs> or divorced. It's a different date. There's a lot of baggage. You gotta apologize for things you didn't have anything to do with. You gotta reassure them a lot. Because in your 20s, you're flexing, right? Like, I'm gonna own a BMW. I've got Hulu without commercials. I'm gonna take care of you. 
in your 30s, you're like, listen, listen, I'm not gonna sleep with your best friend. I'm not gonna clear out your bank account and run off to Nebraska. I don't live with my mother anymore. It's gonna be okay. Because in your 20s, if a woman asks, how are you single? She's flirting with you. In your 30s, she really wants to know. And you better tell her, quick. Uh, but I overshot with my wife for sure. I'm a lucky man, I don't deserve her. But it's almost too much. Because I always wanted to marry a strong, independent woman, sure. But her job is way too good. She is a CT tech at the Trauma One ER IMC in Murray, saving lives all day long. And I do this. So <laughs> I don't have a lot of clout in the house, is what I'm saying. I do what I'm told with a smile in our house. That's the slogan, right? Because we have very different days. Like, she'll come home after a long 10-hour shift. One day she came home with blood on her scrubs, and I was like, babe, what happened? She was like, it was awesome. We saved a guy's life. I was like, tell me everything. She's like, a guy came in with a gunshot wound in his clavicle. Blood was everywhere. They couldn't find the bullet. Put him on my table. They applied pressure. I did the scan, found the bullet. They pulled it out and saved his life. I was like, holy cow. That was awesome. She's like, how was your day, sweetheart? I was like, well, I'm working on this joke about farts. And... <laughs> It's not quite right. <laughs> and I can't tell if she supports or patronizes me when she says, don't worry, sweetheart, you're gonna get it one of these days. You're gonna write the best fart joke ever. <laughs> Either way, I'll take it. But it's hard, because I can't win an argument with this woman. It's impossible. Not that men are known for winning arguments. <laughs> but I can't win any arguments, because anytime we're in an argument and she feels like she's starting to lose, she just hits me with, Paul, I don't have time for this. I have to go save lives. And that's the end. <laughs> There's no comeback for that. That's not fair. Oh, you're saving lives, but you're killing this conversation. I'm a person too. Oh, There's a little bit of an age difference with me and my wife. We're seven years apart, which I think is perfect. I'm not allowed to tell you her age, but I'm 38. You take it from there. <laughs> But even though I think that's a very good age difference, we definitely grew up in different worlds. I was before the tech boom, she was after the tech boom, and we don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. For example, she has never mailed a letter in her life before we met. True story, the first and only time she ever mailed letters were our wedding invitations. I had to explain the mailing system to her. And even after telling her about stamps and how it works and return addresses, she wasn't sold on the process at all. She's like, how do you know they got it? There's no read receipt. And I'm like, I didn't have a good answer for her. How do you explain it? I just looked at her and said, listen, you have to believe in something, okay? <laughs> oh, man. And we have very different perspectives on music, for sure. Um, not that we have different tastes, but just perspectives. We were walking around in the mall one day, I'll never forget it, and a Lady Gaga song came on. And my wife just sighed and said, oh, what a classic. <laughs> no, 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 no. Gaga's not a classic. Gaga is not a classic now or maybe ever, but not now for sure. And that was disrespectful to call Lady Gaga a classic and spit in the faces of the true classics of the 90s like corn and Limp Bizkit. Those, those are the classics. Every time I think about crappy music today, I think about corn and think, you know what? We did some stuff too, you know? <laughs> it's not all of them. Do you think, Cardi B? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like we got married, moved in together, and we learned very quickly that men and women have different priorities on how they want the home to look, quickly, right? Because men only care about functionality. They don't care how it looks as long as it works, right? And women only care how it looks. They don't care if it functions at all. <laughs> and those perspectives conflict a lot. I remember the first battlefield of our marriage was the pantry in the kitchen. It got real in a hurry there. Because I just wanted it to be very simple. Just boxes of cereal, bags of chips, cans of soup. We move on with our lives, right? My wife's like, no, 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 Paul. We're not gonna do that at all. We're gonna take all of our food out of the pantry, get it all out of there, and we're gonna put cute little wooden crates all over the pantry, and then hide all of our food in these wooden crates, so that way nobody knows where the food is ever again. 
because it's cute. It's like my wife's goal is for me to never find Pop-Tarts and she's winning. I hate Pinterest so much. I hate it on a level you could never understand. Oh my gosh. So we did it, but it all worked out though because about a week later, my wife walked into our little Kardashian pantry from hell and she pulled her cute little crystal bowl of oats out ready for the day in the morning. And she looked at me, she's like, hey babe, how long am I supposed to cook oatmeal for again? And I said, I have no idea. If only Quaker had provided instructions somewhere on a box, we wouldn't be in this mess. And she just looked at me and said, Paul, I have to go save lives. I don't have time for this. That's not gonna work forever, young lady. But it probably will, it probably will. Because you get into disagreements when you get married, right? Everyone argues, everyone gets into disagreements. And I will say, my wife and I are very good at about apologizing with each other. When she's wrong, she'll apologize to me. And when I'm wrong, I'll apologize three to five times for three to five days. And we're good, <laughs> we're good. We're very good about apologizing to each other. One thing we're not good at is admitting that the other person's right. We're very bad at that. We're very bad. In fact, we go to extreme lengths to never admit when the other person is right. We've devised phrases to admit defeat without actually saying the words, you're right. We got married in our 30s, we're very mature. Here's a couple real world examples. In fact, the pants I'm wearing right now caused one of these said arguments. I do need, I do need a little bit of help. Would you agree that these are black jeans? Yes? Only the women. Black jeans? Black jeans? Black jeans. My wife, not a chance. I brought these home, I was like, babe, I got some black jeans for my recording show. She's like, those are not black jeans. Jeans have to be blue. And I was like, no, babe, jeans can be all sorts of colors. She's like, no, jeans have to be blue. They're only blue and no other color. I was like, no, jeans like a denim, it's a material. They can be gray, black, red, whatever you want. And she didn't believe me. So we pulled out a computer for a quick Google search. My wife pulled it up, starts looking at all the photos of definitely jeans and other colors. <laughs> Looks at me looks back at the computer to re-verify and just said, well, in my mind, all jeans are blue. <laughs> and that's her phrase, that's her phrase. When my wife says, in my mind, that's her saying, listen, you think whatever you want, but let me keep thinking whatever's in here. <laughs> and it's adorable. But I have a phrase too, I have a phrase too. We got into it about Costco muffins. I know, super. <laughs> Super deep arguments. Listen, when you marry your soulmate and you're good on all the deep issues, you have so much time to argue about the silly stuff. It's great. <laughs> so my wife knew or thought, she was right, but that Costco, <laughs> easy. <laughs> she was right. <laughs> I thought the Costco muffins came in like cardboard containers. My wife knew that they came in clear plastic containers and we got into it about this on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and we had to solve it before Sunday. You can't leave this harbor on Sunday. We had to resolve this. We got in our car at 2.30 in the afternoon to go to Costco to figure out the muffin debate. We get to Costco, we walk all the way to the back and I see that I'm wrong. I see pure plastic containers and I know my wife is right. I look at her, look at the containers, look back at her and I say, well, you're not wrong. <laughs> she didn't like that. She didn't like that at all. She's like, you say that I'm right. You say that I'm right right now. Those are clear plastic containers. I said, look, you're not wrong. Isn't that good enough? I said that you're not wrong. She's like, it's not the same. It's not the same. And I looked at her and I said, well, in my mind, it's the same. <laughs> She didn't like that as much as you, at all, actually. I did not get the same reaction from her. Oh. But marriage is great. Marriage is awesome. But there's things you can't be prepared for when you get married. No matter how many times people try to prepare you, try to prep you, there's gonna be surprises, things you're not ready for. For example, I wasn't ready for the amount of bobby pins that were about to enter my life. You can't, you can't quantify it. They multiply on their own. I don't understand it. I have 47 bobby pins in my Jeep right now. My wife has never done her hair in the car. How is this happening? 
I don't understand it. I feel like every time you lose a sock in the dryer, a bobby pin is born. That's, <laughs> that's my working theory. That's as good as I've got. It doesn't make sense. And on the other end, she wasn't prepared for the amount of farts that were about to enter her life. She wasn't. I held him in like a good man while we dated, absolutely. For nine months, I clenched. I'll clench in an olive garden. I'm not clenching in my own home. That's the deal. You get a diamond ring, I get to fart. That's the deal. That's the deal. But it's, every, it's different for every couple. Are you two married? You two married? How long have you been married? Two years. Okay, I'm coming back to you. I don't know why. I feel like this is dangerous, but I'm going to come back to you. Been married for two years. Me and my wife, about two years. You got a pandemic, married, pandemic wedding as well. That's awesome. Good for you. What was something you weren't ready for when you married her? Something you weren't careful, easy. <laughs> The hair, oh, absolutely. So you don't shave, you're just hairless. You weren't ready for hair to enter your life. You're eating her hair in bed. What, what? You weren't? To be fair, I think someone should have warned you, hey man, you're gonna be eating some hair if you marry this girl. I don't think that's a woman thing, I think that's a her thing. No one is eating hair. The weirdest two people. I didn't plant them, I swear. I didn't plant these two people. I don't understand. But get back at him, video gamer, who probably runs the show. What weren't you ready for when you married a man that wasn't ready to eat your hair? What weren't you ready for? His farts. You're stealing my material now. You're hacking on me? It's farts. Okay, fair enough. Thanks for coming out. You too. <laughs> Oh, but my wife, she's adorable. Does the cutest things all the time. She's just full of magic, my wife. The cutest thing she does is she will talk to animals, but she won't talk to animals. She will just say what she thinks the animal is thinking. <laughs> randomly. And it's the cutest thing in the world. Like, she'll see a squirrel and she's like, oh, I'm just looking for nuts to put in my cheeks. And, oh, she puts like a little jingle on it. She'll go full Mary Poppins on these animals see a bird on the fence, I'm looking for worms to go to the nest. Like, she's just in her own world. It's so cute. But it has gotten weird. Uh, it has. I won't lie to you. One time we were driving to Vegas, and there was a dead deer on the side of the road. And my wife, without skipping a beat, just looked at the deer and said, oh no, I lost my life. <laughs> and just narrated roadkill out of nowhere. The worst part is she just acted like the deer was having a bad day. Like, it was gonna get up tomorrow and be like, well, try again. And I called my wife out, I was like, babe, did you just like talk to a uh, dead deer? And she's like, uh, no, but death can be magical. And I said, not on a highway, not on a highway, ever. The worst part is that has now become my wife and I's number one inside joke. Anytime we see a dead animal, we look at each other, giggle, and say, oh no, I lost my life. <laughs> We've lost some friends. We have. Uh, the judgments have been swift, um, and explaining where the joke came from has not helped at all. Like, it was a dead deer one day. It was awesome. Like, people are like, the Sheffield humor is dark. <laughs> But it hasn't ended. Like, even me, I find myself doing it all the time. Like, I'll pull open the Traeger and look at a perfect rack of ribs and be like, oh, no, I lost my life. And it's not good. Peter's going to be pissed if they ever hear this joke. They're going to be like, that's not ethical. Uh, I didn't bring a lot to this marriage, but I did bring a 25-pound beagle that's codependent and has to sleep in bed with us. So I do feel like my wife wasn't prepared for that. Uh, we took the newlywed game up a notch, right? And I love my dog, I'm a, I love my dog. I named him Rod, it's an acronym, Ride or Die, that's my dog's name, which I think is, yeah, great name for a dog. Loyalty, companionship, sticking together. Terrible name for my dog, terrible. So you wanna know, after nine years of taking care of this animal, doing everything for him, you wanna know whose favorite person in the entire world is? Anyone else that comes over to my house. That doorbell rings is the best moment of his life. I don't even exist. He sprints to the door, ready for 10 minutes of undivided attention. That, 
is his favorite thing in the world. So just know, if you come over to my house, my dog already loves you and expects you to love him in return. And it's hard when non-dog people come over. I'm like, listen, you're about to get attacked with love. Just accept it, okay? And I hate it, because after whoever leaves, of course, after everyone leaves, after whoever it is leaves, my dog will just trot back over to me like nothing's happened. Like, we're cool, right? I can cuddle up to you again. It feels toxic. I feel like it's a toxic relationship with my dog. I don't like it. But I do love him. I love pets. I wish pets could talk. I think that's the only thing they're missing. If pets could talk, we wouldn't care about kids, right? <laughs> pets have everything else. Think about it. You get to pick the exact one you want, off to a great start. They will never complain about eating the exact same thing for their entire life. Clothing's optional. And you get to pick a new one out every about 12 years. It's a good gig. There's no, there's no downside. And if one dies, the police don't even show up. It's kind of okay. It's like... I had to, I'm sorry, I had to. If they could talk, our species would cease to exist. That is the only thing that they're missing. <laughs> and even though my dog is just the best dog in the world, he's adorable, he's the best, I love him, he is a psychopath when I give him a chew toy and it really kind of freaks me out, okay? Because he will only accept chew toys that are animals. His favorite are the bird chew toys and he gouges the eyes first every time. <laughs> Like a serial killer. I don't understand how this happened. I'm like, easy, man. It's not an incriminating witness. It's just a chew toy. He's like, no way, man. It's seen too much. <laughs> and I'm stressed. He sleeps in bed with me and usually between my legs. What am I going to do? I neutered this guy. What if he seeks revenge? What if he snaps one night? It's times like that. I wish someone would offer me $100,000 for my dog. I'd take that deal. Absolutely. Hold on you're gonna come around to me on this one. There's actually, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a YouTube of a guy that walks in parks with a black briefcase offering $100,000 cash for someone's dog. And people are all taking the high ground. No way, not my Rufus, he's part of the family. I'd never do that. I want that man to find me. I want him to find me, because boy, do I have a deal for you. Just think about it, if you're not on board, what kind of a person can afford $100,000 in Beagle money? Round of applause if you have a hundred grand for a dog right now. Anyone? No, that's what I thought. <laughs> so what kind of a person is gonna do that? Someone's gonna give my dog a way better life than I could, okay? You're never gonna know what pedigree is for the rest of your life, okay? This is a win-win situation. And listen, $100,000, I'll buy three dogs from the shelter, he gets a new owner. It's a win-win for everybody. It's gonna be a good gig. And you don't think my dog would take that deal? Have you not been listening to everything I've been saying? My dog would sell me down the road for a begging strip, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. I got, an, I got a dog to enrich my life. $100,000, mission accomplished, okay? <laughs> That's all I'm saying there. And after nine years, listen, we had a good run, me and my dog, but the, you know, we're nearing the end. And if someone wants to pay 100 grand, I'm in. 100 grand for a nine-year-old beagle's like, trading Aaron Rodgers at 39 years old to the New York Jets. You don't want to do it, but you do it. I had one. I had one in the chamber. I hope his Achilles is okay. I'm just saying. Oh, too far? That a guy who's made $400 million snapped his Achilles? Okay. How could you? <laughs> All right, now that I've brought the mood down, let's talk about something serious. <laughs> yeah, that was a good transition. A good friend of mine, Tom, got into a very tragic motorcycle accident about a year ago. Uh, was driving his motorcycle, got hit by a Prius. Flipped over it, broke his pelvis, and both of his femurs. That's the appropriate response, absolutely. It was a bad accident. I went to go visit him in the hospital because I wanted to go check on him, right? And I was amazed at his perspective, his attitude when I went and visited him. I was like, hey man, how are you holding up? What can I do for you? It's such a big accident. What can I do to help? And he's like, Paul, I'm good, man. You don't have to worry about it at all. It could have been so much worse. I feel lucky. I was impressed. I was like, lucky? How could you feel lucky right now? It's a big deal. 
broke both your femurs. He's like, I know, I know it looks bad, but can you imagine what would have happened if I got hit by a real car? And, <laughs> and I don't know if it was the medication or not, but that's a good point. <laughs> Perspective is everything. And don't worry about his motorcycle, it's fine. Couple scratches, no big deal. No big deal at all. The Prius totaled, it's gone. It didn't make it. Not because of damage, just the insurance company knew it had no value, so they had to get that off the streets real quick. The Prius driver, very nice, got out, tried to help the best he could. He was weakened as well. He was coming home from his vasectomy appointment, so he couldn't do a whole lot. He just wanted to get home to his beautiful wife and four daughters. He wasn't looking for anything. <laughs> Maybe crack open an O'Doul's just to take off the edge of a very traumatic day. <laughs> Can you imagine if there was a man like that? Like if you have a Prius driver, you can't buy O'Doul's. You can't. You can't lean into the stereotype that hard. <laughs> but maybe someone does. But I do want to say real quick, my buddy Tom that was in that accident is here tonight. He's a very good friend of mine. I'm so happy that he recovered. He's walking, he's titanium reinforced. Thank you so much for letting me uh, talk about that event right here on stage. He's a good friend, he's a very good friend. But when he, that accident happened, he wanted me to let everyone know. He's like, listen, you can take this to the stage, Paul. But I want everyone to know that those Mission Impossible movies with those motorcycle scenes are bullshit. <laughs> There is no way that anyone is flying off of motorcycles, hitting the pavement, and then getting up and running away. There's no way. And I was like, listen, Tom, I know you've been through a lot, and I know you're in a lot of pain right now, but have you seen Tiger King? <laughs> Anything is possible, okay? I don't. And then he asked me to leave, and that's fair. That's fair. I wish you were sitting here. I'm just gonna say that. I, don't. I mean that in the nicest way. I mean that in the nicest way. I have so many questions that I feel like she would nail. But thank you so much for coming. I know getting out of the house is a big deal for you, so. have to give me a break, okay? I gotta, I gotta get through this somehow. Get here earlier next time. I'm kidding. Thanks for... I'll wait. I don't got anywhere to be. You can't pay for this sort of laughter. I'm... Because I'm not going to lie to you, I'm not going to lie to you. As a comedian, our best case scenario is to have the whole crowd hit the roof every joke. That's what we all want. That's number one best case scenario. Number two is one person losing their mind. <laughs> you all are having a normal, average time laughing appropriately, and one person's having an out-of-body experience <laughs> and has transcended to another sphere. We love it as comedians. It's the best. <laughs> so I will never stop you. This is the second best case scenario of any show that could ever happen. <laughs> what was that? She stopped laughing when you started talking, so that's not a good sign. That's, that's bad. He ruined it. <laughs> Saying something ineligible, I don't know. I do have a college degree. I got a degree in marketing. Uh, that's probably why I do this. <laughs> don't say nice before the punchline, thank you. He's ruining everything. <laughs> Switch with them. But I did get a degree and I don't use it like most millennials, I don't use it in my job. That's where you would laugh, I get that. That's right. 
But what I am now is a professional commercial critic. That is what I use my degree with. Every day I'll just critique commercials. That's what I do. Beer commercials are the worst. I hate beer commercials so much. They used to be fun. They used just to be like talking frogs and parties that would never happen. And I miss those days. Because now beer commercials are inspirational. And they're like talking about people changing their lives and then giving the credit to beer. And <laughs> that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like, there's never been an award show where someone grabs their Academy Awards, like, I'd like to thank Miller for taking the time. Like, that's never happened. That doesn't happen. Modelo Especial commercials are the worst, brewed with a fighting spirit. It's the worst, man, because they have all these stories about people that changed their careers and then gave the credit to Modelo for being there <laughs> to inspire them. I don't get it, man. Like, one, there was this commercial where a lady was a cop. She didn't want to be a cop anymore. She wanted to be a DJ. <laughs> So she quit her job in law enforcement and became a DJ. And I can't think of a drunker decision <laughs> that has ever happened in the history of the world. To go from a career where not a lot of people like or respect you to a career where no one likes or respects you. And now you don't have health insurance. That's bold. That's bold. You definitely had put back a few when you made that call. But some of the commercials are just weird because they'd make it sound so much worse than it was. Like another one of them was a guy that just wanted to be a barber. That's all he wanted to be. But Modelo made it super dramatic. Like if he were to listen to the naysayers, he wouldn't be cutting the freshest fades in the community. The naysayers? Who's telling this guy that he can't be a barber? That's a normal standard profession. Who's out there saying, no way, man, you'll never make it in the haircutting game. Be a plumber like a normal human. He's probably drunk on Modelo. Don't listen to this guy. It's weird, man. And I know that joke probably wasn't for everyone. I could tell, like, that kind of split the room. But you got to understand something. In my mind, that's a killer bit. And it should crush every single time. That one got someone for the first time. I haven't heard that cackle before. You got competition now. We're one snort away from doing the whole trifecta of sounds. This is gonna be, you guys are slacking with normalcy. I'm just saying, very reverent, very appropriate, very ready for Sunday vibe here. Party's over here. Just sorry. I'm sorry. There's still a chance for you. This is like a more O'Doul's crowd. I feel like there's a thing. <laughs> Modelo, bold. <laughs> oh, man. Well, now that you guys are nice and unified, let's talk politics. Let's... Yes! <laughs> Haven't divided you quite enough yet. Right? Listen, has enough time passed we can talk about it? Trump was president. It was a thing. It happened. He was president. It was kind of cool. Whether you liked him or hated him, it was actually pretty cool that Trump became president. Because when Donald Trump became president, I learned a couple of things. Number one, anyone can become president. That, we learned that, you know? You don't think, you think you have to go to an Ivy League school or be a good person. None of that's needed at all. Anyone in this country can become president, except Hillary Clinton. We know that now, we know. She's the one exception. <laughs> but you know what else I realized when Trump became president? I realized that president of the United States of America is an entry level position. I, I had no idea. Think about it. He had, Trump had never been a governor or in the Senate or in the House. He never even worked for Parks and Rec, nothing. He just decided that he wanted to be president and became president. That's wild. So I looked it up. Do you know what the two qualifications are to become president? There's only two. What are they? 35. What did you say? U.S. citizen, natural born. Hold on. This feels like this was like an improv request. There, it was, there are just two qualifications. I think I heard 35 and a natural born citizen. Those are the only two requirements. So just be 35 and have a birth certificate. And even the birth certificate, there's some wiggle room, I've heard. There's it's kind of a gray area from what I've heard. That's pretty wild. I should put that on my resume. I could run this country. I'm qualified. I should demand a raise for my work. 
if I ever wanted to like move into management, they'd sit me down, Paul, why do you think you're qualified for upper management? They're like, listen, I could run this whole country. I think I can handle 10 Gen Zers that need constant validation, all right? That's insane, man. It's insane that that's all it takes to become president. I got a four-year degree from the University of Utah in five years, but I got a four-year four degree in business marketing, and I couldn't get an entry-level job because I hadn't done a full year unpaid internship at any other company. So they said, kiss off, Paul. And Trump became president. He didn't even job shadow Obama for a day just to see if he wanted the gig. It's crazy to me. It doesn't make any sense. And listen, the Founding Fathers were very smart people. They're very smart. They did a lot of great things. And I don't want to change the rules. I don't want to change the rules of becoming president because I like that. But I want to add something, just one little thing, just one little touch of a thing. Like the amendments, I want to add one thing. If 35 is the minimum age, maybe we just throw a maximum age, just right on the, just at the top. You have to be 35. You can't be over the 65. Let's just throw that 30-year sweet spot in the middle. Because like or hate Obama, all the lights were on. That's all I'm saying. He did. He was at 39. But I don't understand. I don't know about you, but I don't see a lot of difference between a 77-year-old white guy and a 74-year-old orange guy arguing <laughs> about who's going to change the country. OK? They haven't changed what they ate for dinner in 20 years. They're gonna change the country, really? <laughs> Round of applause if you would trust your grandfather right now to negotiate with Russia. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? No, not a chance in the world, but we're gonna trust someone else's? No. We don't even trust family reunions with grandpa. Nana does that. <laughs> Nana's in charge. Grandpa, you flip the burgers, we'll take it from here. back to sanity. I don't understand. <laughs> That's my thoughts. And listen, I'm not saying I'd be a good president. I'm not saying I could be president, but I got a couple ideas, okay? <laughs> if I was president, there's two things I'm changing right out the gate. It's not even a question. First one has bothered me for years. It's deep in my soul. And it's been talked about here and there, but no one's had the balls to stand up and actually make some changes in this country. And we're just relying on an outdated tradition that should have been changed a long time ago. First thing I'm doing right out the gate, Halloween's on the last Friday in October, okay? Why the hell are we doing this to ourselves? We're putting it on a Tuesday? Just because it has to be on the day? We give a four-day weekend for pie and football in November, but heaven forbid that the one day that both kids and adults need a day to recover, we just slide that onto a Friday. What is the problem here? I know I lost the Latino vote there, but listen. <laughs> no one's respecting the dead. I don't care. Have you seen these costumes? No one's thinking about the dead. Put it on a Friday and let's party like we should. <laughs> That's the first thing I would do. Thank you for waiting for everyone else to stop clapping so you'd be like, I got you. <laughs> Second thing I would change. The second thing I would change, actually something very dear to my heart, very, very personal to me. Because like I said, mentioned earlier, for a lot of years, it was just me and my mom. I grew up in a single parent home on a teacher's salary. And if I was president, it's about time we start paying teachers as much as we pay doctors. Absolutely, 100%, 100%. But teachers are gonna start working as much as doctors. Yeah, yeah. Say goodbye to your nights, weekends, and holidays, education. And that three months you get off, not a chance. You're going into 12-hour shifts from hell with kids who don't know multiplication. You want a quarter mil? You're going to earn it. But it'd be awesome. I would, like, construct 24-hour emergency education clinics. <laughs> and you parents can just drop your kids off anytime you want. Free babysitters. Parents, teachers are going to be there. Listen, they don't know math, education, history, whatever. We're going to the movies. Enjoy that quarter mil. You're earning it. <laughs> so that's what I would do. Oh, you guys have been a lot of fun. Can I put this here for a sec? Thank you so much. 
you laugh at the weird times. You know? <laughs> the whole show. Everyone else laughs, you're like, no. I want to be like her, but in an annoying way. You laugh at the wrong times. She laughs at the right times, at least, and I just broke this. Perfect. It's an album recording with duct tape. Yep. Sprung for the good mic stand. Absolutely. But no, you guys have been so much fun. I do really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for coming out. I do have some merchandise, as I do with any new album. I've got some stuff. Uh, it has caused some conflict in the home, so we're going to talk about it. First thing I have, as you know, I'm a mug man. I like, I, this is the you're not wrong, but in my mind mug. So <laughs> you can take this home, and you can like pull it out to like end the fight. Like, listen, I'm not going to say anything, but we should stop fighting, right? <laughs> And for those who know my other albums, I've always done mugs. But when I got married, my wife's like, no, we need to do a shirt. People like shirts, Paul. I was like, nah, people like mugs. She's like, no, people like shirts. So I did a shirt, too. <laughs> so this is the you're not wrong, but in my mind shirt. No, 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 no. That's not as good as the mug. No, 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 no. Don't support her. No. Crowd, no. Shut up. <laughs> yes, I just shouted shut up to my in-laws, but... I'm not okay with this. Absolutely not. So my wife's like, no, you got to do a shirt. People like shirts more. And I was like, no, people like mugs. So what I did is I made shirts and mugs, and now we're going to find out who's right. And unfortunately, I don't feel like I'm in a good spot. So I'm going to make a rule. Listen, if you buy a mug, you don't have to buy a shirt. But if you buy a shirt, you have to buy a mug. Oh, man, this is not going to go well after this show. I have a bad feeling. But I do want to do something special for you guys. I've never done this before, actually. Never done this before. Actually, never even talked about this with anyone. I'm going to do something. You guys have been the best crowd I've ever recorded for, easily. Not even close. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, for real. You guys have been so good. And round of applause if you've seen me before. Round of applause if you've seen me before. Yeah, good solid number, about half of you. And so you guys can vouch. I've never said this for any crowd ever before. Best recording crowd I've ever been from, not even close. So what I want to do, I have my first album, Sheffield Had It Worse. I brought 200 of them. They're the last 200. That's not true, I have one more box downstairs. But <laughs> I don't know why I lied to you. I don't know why. I couldn't reach it, and capacity here is 238. I don't know why, I was too honest. <laughs> anyway, I want to give everyone here tonight a copy of my first album, so that way you have it. And you know, when everyone says, were you at Paul's best show? Now you know, that's the true best show. Not any other show, this show. You guys have earned it, so. Thank you. Don't open it, not that you would. CD players aren't a thing anymore. But don't open it. One day I want to be able to like, I want to put out something, let's say things go well. I want to be able to put out, anyone with my first record gets free tickets or something. So I want to give it, you guys have been such a good crowd. You should be a crowd again. You know what I mean? That's what I'm just trying to say. Like, Get on an email chain and be like, we're an awesome crowd. We should do this again sometime. Maybe adjust the seating, but you're a Stella great crowd. You belong here, just saying. So after the show, come stop by the booth and buy mugs, maybe a shirt. But even if you don't buy anything, come grab a free CD from my first album to remember the best recording crowd I've ever been with. So thank you so much. I got one more, and then I'm going to get out of your hair. Is that fair? We good? <laughs> You've stopped laughing. He won't stop. It's <laughs> front and center. <laughs> But I'm gonna leave you with this. I like to always end with true stories, and this one is unfortunately 100% true. It's well documented if you've heard my other albums that I have IBS, uh, it's irritable bowel syndrome. Thank you for one person that cares about me. Other people laugh and you care, I appreciate that. And I'm not gonna get into it, I'm not gonna go into detail like my other albums, but I'll get you up to speed. <laughs> I got Giardia in Nicaragua, and now I haven't trusted a fart since 2005. That's... There, you're up to speed. This is gonna be good.
but it sucks having IBS because I can't be a normal person. I'm already left-handed, now I have IBS. <laughs> I might as well join the circus at this point. It's not good. Because I don't get to enjoy in the simple pleasantries that you all get to enjoy on a daily basis, like getting away with a fart. Like I've always, <laughs> I've always wanted to do that, right? Like I see it when people fart, everyone else laughs and launches an investigation because no one knows who it is, right? Like, who was it? Who was it? Come on, fess up. Who was it? Joe, Brandon, Candace, who was it? Someone. And if it is you, you kind of slink back into the shadows. Like, good, I got away with it. They'll never tell. But when I fart, everyone's like, Paul, oh my gosh. What are you doing to us? There's dip on the counter. You've ruined the Super Bowl. Like, I get it. It's not fair, man. I just want to get away with a fart. One time. That's all I want. And tonight I'd like to leave you with the story of the one and only time that I did get away with a fart. Not only did I get away with a fart, I was able to witness its devastating effects without an ounce of suspicion. And it was the greatest day of my life. So I'm gonna tell you, I was at work, which is always a great start. And I work on the fourth floor of my building. And me and my buddy Mike, we were getting ready to end the day go home, we got in the elevator, go down to the first floor, and I realized I forgot my keys. It's like, hey man, I forgot my keys, I gotta go grab them. He's like, no worries man, I'll wait for you. So I got back in the elevator, pushed the fourth floor, doors closed, I dropped my gym bag, and as I drop it, I accidentally let off the worst fart of my entire life. Or best, depending on how you look at it. I mean, this thing was wild, okay? It started off silent but deadly, finished off loud and proud. It, was good. And I instantly got filled with terror. No one farts in an elevator. That's like the first rule of society. That's social suicide. And I just remember thinking, I'm for sure going to HR for this one. This is bad. I just hiroshima this elevator. The walls shook. Do you know what I mean? And I am just absolutely petrified that I'm gonna get to the fourth floor, these doors are open, and there's gonna be someone else on the other end that's gonna take me down. Cause you can't get out of it, I mean, you can't be like, whoa, who did that? Like, <laughs> you're stuck. And it's not like they were gonna be able to ignore what they smelled, so. But by the grace of the heavens, those doors open, no one's there. And I instantly sprint away from ground zero as fast as humanly possible to get as far away from the nuke. Get to my desk, but what I didn't tell you is there are actually five floors in my office. And while I went to go get my keys, that biohazard continued up. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, when I got back to the elevator well, that same elevator came down and opened in front of me, revealing six of my coworkers <laughs> gasping for air within an inch of their lives clutching their noses, reaching for the walls. All the accusing, the accusing. It was you, no it was you, how could I do this? The blamer's the flamer, I don't have time to rhyme. It was awesome. And I just stood back and said, what happened in there? But I knew. Now I know why serial killers go back to the scene of the crime. It's incredible. The rush, the rush. It was like I was leaning over the caution tape thinking, good luck solving this one, detectives. <laughs> not only did they not suspect me, they were worried about me. They warned me. Paul, don't come any closer. Don't enter here. Save yourself. And I just said, okay, man, I'll believe you. Weirdest part, not one of them got out. It was like their Titanic moment. We're going down with this fart. We started this, we're saying it through. And the doors just closed. And I took an uncontaminated safe elevator back down to the first floor. And when I got down there, my buddy Mike, who'd been waiting for me, had just witnessed six coworkers leave an elevator faster than anyone ever has. I get out of the other one. He didn't even ask, he just looked at me and said, you did it. And I looked back at him and I said, you're not wrong. 
but good luck proving it. But the story doesn't end there, my friends. The next day I went to go check on one of my victims, I mean coworkers, because I wanted to see if they survived. I went and asked one of them, I was like, hey, how did that work out? Did you guys figure out who, uh, who farted in there? I wanted to see if my cover was blown. She's like, no, Paul, it's worse than we ever imagined. And I was like, what? The story of my fart had grown into legend in just one day. She's like, Paul, you'll never believe it. As we were getting in the elevator, someone threw a stink bomb in there. They're trying to prank the fifth floor. And I'm like, why do you think that? And she said, and I quote, because no human being could have created that smell. <laughs> Legend. <laughs> Thank you. And listen, I don't need a lot to happen with my comedy career. I'm so happy with where it is. All I want, the only thing I ever want is this story to make it on the internet deep enough that those coworkers come across it one day. And it pulls up on their phone and as they relive that horrific day, they just stop whatever they're doing and say, what? And I hope that they can laugh at it as much as you guys laughed at it here tonight. Because listen, I may not save lives, but laughter is the best medicine. And I'm just out here filling prescriptions. Thank you guys so much for coming out. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Sheffield. <laughs>